Thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Ash. I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective, and I'm really excited to host tonight's discussion between Josh McPhee and Alec Dunn, who are the editors of Signal, a journal of international political graphics and culture. Before we start, uh, for folks who are not familiar, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a 13-year-old worker-owned cooperative and radical bookstore in so-called Asheville, North Carolina, on the traditional lands of Cherokee people. We're an anarchist collective that is well known for our curated inventory of titles related to feminism, queerness, social movements, and radical politics. We ship books all across the country, and if you haven't checked us out yet, our full catalog is available on our website, which I will drop links to in the chat. Firestorm is also a community event space. Unfortunately, with the ongoing pandemic, we continue to be on hiatus with in-person gatherings. Um, and have transitioned our community and author events entirely to an online virtual space. However, we do have a slew of exciting virtual events coming up in collaboration with folks like PM Press and other indie publishers. So if you're interested in staying informed about events happening through Firestorm, you can follow us on social media, and I will also drop a link to our community calendar in the chat. And just a note for those attending in the live audience, there will be time at the end of today's conversation for Q&A. So if you're interested in asking a question at any point, I'll encourage you to submit them throughout the discussion by using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen uh, if you're attending on Zoom or in the comments if you are following along on the Facebook live stream. As for tonight's event, like I said earlier, we are here for a discussion about Signal, a journal of international political graphics and culture. Signal is an ongoing book series published by PM Press and dedicated to documenting and sharing compelling graphics, art projects, and cultural movements of international resistance and liberation struggles. The series brings together material produced all over the world, translated from dozens of languages, and collected from both contemporary social movements and those of the past. Signal is not limited to the graphic arts. Within its pages, you will also find political posters, comics, murals, street art, zines, art collectives, documentation of performance, and articles on the essential role all of these have played in struggles around the world. And we're joined tonight by the two editors of Signal. Uh, so we have Josh McPhee, a designer, artist, and archivist. He is a founding member of the Just Seeds Artist Cooperative, uh, the author of an exciting, an, an encyclopedia of political record labels, and he co-founded and helps run Interference Archive, a public collection of cultural materials produced by social movements. Alec Dunn is an illustrator, writer, and printer living in Portland, Oregon. He has designed book and record covers, political graphics, punk flyers, and is a member of the Just Seeds Artist Cooperative. Alec is also a nurse who works in critical care, harm reduction, and street medicine. Josh, Alec, thanks so much for being here tonight, and I will pass it over to you. Thanks, Ash. And thanks for having us. Josh, you're the first to talk, so I'm gonna, you'll, why don't you just keep going? Okay. So both, both Alec and I um, came out of sort of punk and um, sort of subcultural music uh, milieus or scenes in the 1980s and 90s. And through those started 
making um, and creating sort of applied art flyers and record covers and um, and all of the kind of uh, ephemera that comes from being part of a, a cultural scene. And, and then I think that our paths are, of course, not exactly the same, but we both kind of dovetailed into doing that kind of work for um, community organizations and protest movements uh, in the, in the mid nineties and into the two thousands. And, and one thing, um, that we realized, uh, you know, we've known each other for a long time, uh, is that, you know, as of like the late 1990s, early two thousands, the two flyers you see up here on the screen, this is like what a significant amount of sort of left-wing political material looked like, uh, in the U S and we had started seeing all kinds of material from all around the world and other time periods that look so different than this and so much more exciting and expansive and explosive. Um, here's a couple examples from Japan, one from the 20s and one from the 1980s. Um, and we're like, why can't our stuff look like this? Why does it, why does it always have to look like this? Um, and so that started us on this journey. I don't know if you want to sort of take it. Well, I think the only thing I would think about there too is there's, there was a, I mean, Josh and I are about the same age and grew up around the same time. And I, I think that things have changed considerably, but you know, there was Absolutely. such a weird break in uh, like left knowledge and wisdom and history. I mean, the younger generation that we were part of when we were young, um, I think, you know, we had some maybe occasional elders and baby boomers and even people older than that, but not really that many. So, I mean, you know, it's almost like a shock to go back and see stuff from the 70s and even early 80s that was graphically from the US that was kind of amazing. And, but by the time really that, yeah, in the 90s, like it was all that desktop publishing um, and, you know, occasional, um, you know, a couple of people that whose work was used a lot, like Eric Drucker or, or Peter Cooper, people out of like World War III Illustrated Anyway, whatever, that's kind of ancient history at this point. But, um, you know, there's such a great history, even in this country, of people using graphics in political movements and as part of political movements. And, uh, um, yeah, and then when we started seeing stuff internationally, I mean, the stuff from Japan is obviously just has such a different graphic language based on even how the, uh, the um, letter forms are and constructed uh, and a lot of stuff you know, especially we were seeing from like anarchist and squatting movements from Europe, which was also um, uh, uh, graphically like just a lot more exuberant and, and interesting than a lot of stuff we were seeing. Yeah, I mean, we we decided that we wanted to start collecting and and sort of representing this material both for ourselves. We were really interested in in sort of exploring this history, but also in hopes of kind of like kickstarting in our own small little way, um, more experimentation and sort of graphic exploration in our own kind of contexts and backyards. And um, the way we started doing this is in the mid 2000s, we, we saved up and took a trip to Europe. And um, we, we traveled to, I don't know what, three, four different, four different countries maybe. Um, we, we were on the road for a couple of weeks and one of the places that we stayed was in Copenhagen and it was right at the sort of mid level of um, this huge struggle that was going on around uh, a building called Ungdom Shuset, which was the youth house that since the 1980s had been uh, originally squatted and I think sort of tacitly given to um, youth in in Copenhagen uh, to have a soup kitchen and to have shows. And I think at different points in time, people would live there. And then uh, the government of Copenhagen decided in the mid 2000s that they were gonna sell the building because it was worth too much money and they sold it to a right wing uh, organization and caused a huge revolt amongst the youth in the city. Um, and we were just sort of blown away by the graphic culture that was coming out of that struggle. Never mind the larger political terrain, which was also really interesting, but this poster was a great example of what was coming out of that, that battle, which is this amazing hybrid of like graffiti and heavy metal graphics and sort of um, neo psychedelia, almost like kind of, cause it has a sort of 
druggy kind of aspect, but much harder edged than a 60s um, psychedelia. The colors are bright and explosive. Um, and so we just sort of fell in love with this kind of stuff and wanted to sort of bring it home. And, and you know, in our, in our own ways, we had all been collecting, um, we had each been collecting kind of all kinds of publications that touched on the history of sort of politics and art and politics and design, politics and culture from sort of 1960s magazines like Sing Out, which was sort of an appendage to the Folkways record label that, that really was one of the best documents of the civil rights movement in this country through the lens of song to temporary hoarding, which is a publication that Rock Against Racism um, put out in the late 1970s in the UK. Uh, Vague was a political, uh, a sort of proto situationist kind of ultra anarchist, uh, but slick magazine that came out of the UK in the 80s. So we're just sort of like jumping around and, and, and looking at and finding and tracking down. This was all kind of the internet existed, but not in the way that it existed now. Like we had to find this stuff in bookshops. So, you know, we'd come across these and be like, oh, this is amazing. Um, and kind of decided we, we really needed to do something like this for ourselves and what was going on, you know, now by collecting and tracking back through this whole history. This is this is the view, right? This is yeah. This was the view. So I mean, we'll go up here. This was on this trip. We were in Amsterdam and uh, went to the Institute for Social History, which is a a big archive there. And this was trying to get stuff together for the first issue of Signal. This was a photo I took. I I enjoyed the uh, overgrownness of the boat. There was it was mostly a bust, and it was pretty hard. And I think it's still fairly hard to research. Um, political movements. I mean, Josh uh, maybe was part of a group that partly in reaction to the kind of um, ivory wall of academia and archives, you know, of not really allowing people to look through stuff or use images or access stuff. I mean, we went to this enormous kind of archive of left and social movements in Amsterdam and we just could not get access to anything. You know, we thought if we went in person, I think we would be able to kind of flip through and look at stuff and we're kind of stonewalled by archivists and librarians there and so probably the most interesting aspect of that trip was this overgrown laugh crap <laughs> that someone was living on um and uh you know humorously enough and we've told this story before so if you've ever heard it before but you know we encountered a like a squatter woman leaving the library who was like had permission to dumpster dive and had it you know was finding incredible stuff in their trash but even you even had to get permission to go to their locked dumpster, which we couldn't get. So uh, kind of a bust there. And, uh, you know, Josh is sitting in Interference Archive, which has uh, been an alternative archive, which uh, is a lot more focused on um, openness and user interaction and, and, and kind of acknowledging memory's vital role in social movements. And maybe we can talk about that later. We did have more luck in the next image, which was the Kate Sharpley Library, which is a really it's more like a private archive or semi-private archive that um, had uh, the archive itself had emigrated from England to the U.S. Um, uh, along with one of the main archivists, Barry Pateman, uh, probably in the '80s, I would assume, uh, '90s. Do you know? Yeah, yeah. early maybe early '90s. Yeah, and he had a vacation house and. Grass Valley, California, which is in the mountains, kind of the dry mountains of Northern California. Uh, we had a friend go drop us off for the weekend and it's like a five mile walk to town to get ice cream, which was our activity during <laughs> the day. And then otherwise we just kind of dug through, it was an incredible collection of books and flyers. Um, you know, maybe only limited that it was, it's almost entirely anarchist focused, but it was a, a, a lot of fun. We'd love to go back at some point if we could. And then this is it, it, Kate Sharpley is sort of in between the the Institute for Social History, and then this is the basement. It's a basement garage underneath the Anomalia Bookshop in Rome, which is 
one of the longest running uh, anarchist bookshops that had started in the 1960s, I believe, um, in Rome. And um, there was literally just piles and piles of stuff that was moldering because they didn't have the resources to keep it up, which was part of part of the, the impetus of Signal was that it's, it's one thing to document things and there's a lot of that that goes on. It's another thing to document them in a way that gives people a point of entry and access. And so um, it's not so much that for us Signal was about like creating some massive depth of an archive in which you could go back and find every little thing about a subject, but it's, it's to take some of these posters that are rolled up here and to be able to reproduce them and show that they existed before they're literally gone. Um, in some instances. And I would point out also that we had incredible generosity in like some info shops we visited in Berlin. And like, I think it was Paper Tiger was one. Yeah. Where they were like, if there's extra, you know, just take whatever you want and, you know, go to town. I mean, but it was often like this. It was like stuff stuffed in the back of drawers and, uh, you know, things like this obviously still exist and stuff is still kind of tucked away. It's part of the joy of trying to find stuff uh, you know in a perverse way maybe oh oh well um i'm gonna i'm gonna skip quickly through some slides because i thought that those were um hidden from view um but so i might do a little jumping around uh i had made this map just for this show in general and it was you know kind of illuminating to maybe ourselves i mean i think i knew the distribution of where articles have been so this is actually just kind of color coded for um all the articles we've had in signal and you can really see you know um the you know western europe and new york and the bay area both uh figure large in there and it's uh you know, points to some gaps we have, obviously. Um, but I don't, I didn't count the total amount we've had, maybe 40 plus interviews and articles and features. Um, you know, trying to find stuff from around the world, it's, uh, um, let's see, what can I say about this? You know, Josh and I are editors, and there's probably not actually a lot about editing that is interesting. I mean, we've both written stuff for the magazine itself. But the things that are maybe interesting to us as editors are probably not what's interesting to anyone else. But um, I think, you know, we both come out of making political graphics. We're both image makers. And we've both worked with um, small campaigns, large campaigns, social movements. And I think that gives us a little bit of a, a feeling for, um, I think, the stuff that we think is, is useful and interesting. I mean, I think we've always had a focus on um, you know, how is the image used? How was it made? Um, what was its impact? And, and is stuff interesting or, or just, you know, so odd to us? And, and we've kind of touched on this, but um, I think, you know, with a goal also of like kind of challenging people's uh, creative senses when they're working with social movements on, on image making, breaking out of some tropes and ruts uh, that are, you know, endemic to left wing graphics rich history, uh, but also maybe working with some of those tropes and ruts and, and taking them somewhere else. Um, we had talked earlier this week that we're like, you know, our curatorial uh, vision is often about what is we can get our hands on and it's not often a lot, whether it's an article or, or something we're gonna do ourselves. But I think there's a intention behind being a little bit anti curatorial. I think um, maybe a leveling of like feeling of importance of uh, that the canon isn't about a certain image by Tommy Unger or uh, Barbara Kruger or something, but it's the canon is kind of the movement and, and um, the struggle for liberation, uh, justice, freedom, things like that. And that kind of is something that is global. And uh, it's interesting to see how that stuff is permutated out in the world. I also think that we hadn't really thought about the, the sort of reality, which is changing in some ways and, and not in others, that um, there are people that make this stuff 
And then there are people that sort of study this stuff for academia, like within an academic context. And there really is not a lot of people who write or talk about or present kind of movement culture to a general audience. Um, that, you know, the reality is that most of us interact with and participate in different kinds of organizing and activism at different points in our lives. It's, it's not um, necessarily a very marginal activity, contrary to sort of the way that the status quo wants us to believe, yet there's so little general audience kind of scholarship or discussion about movement culture. Um, doesn't get a lot of play within art world context because it sort of challenges a set of assumptions that the art world wants to maintain about authorship and um, sort of the nature of creativity and, and ownership and, and things like that. And, um, and so it's, it's actually been one of the biggest challenges has been finding people who are able and willing to write um, about things at a level of depth that makes the writing interesting and worthwhile, but in a way that's still accessible and not sort of where every sentence has six footnotes attached to it. And it's sort of densely self-referential. Um, and I mean, I think we sort of, in a way, sort of tried to like blaze a trail of, of like, there is a way to do that. I mean, you, the seventies, the there's all kinds of political art magazines that have this sort of very accessible writing about all kinds of things and then it just sort of disappears um for the most part and so i think we we've been trying to kind of revive that tradition in a way and so i think that we're just going to sort of go through some of the loose categories of the material that we've included um, in, in the seven issues as, as a way to kind of be able to talk about some of this stuff and then also kind of give a nice overview of the contents. Um, because we don't, I mean, each, each magazine or book is its own discrete object, but we tend to think about it as, a, as an overarching project. So like, I mean, I know, like I, I keep them all, you know, together in a stack because it's like a little, little reference library um, and, and don't, necessarily think about each one as a sort of discrete object so this is like a nice mix and, and match of, of kind of all the kinds of stuff that that we've squeezed into all, uh, all the issues so far and so some the categories are a little bit arbitrary like i think it's stuff that we think about but we could have easily put stuff by continent or medium or whatever but i think you know when we talk about stuff and you know the and collectives and groups is up front it's probably the thing we have the most features on so on this page you can see there are images from the um protests in mexico in 1968 but you know the focus of that article was really about the people who are making uh these images kind of while stuff was happening and how they did it and posting them on the side of buses and, and where they were printing and, and kind of questions like that and why certain images were used uh, yeah, I mean, literally talking about how they took shifts uh, sleeping underneath the tables while people were printing because there was a need to be printing 24 hours a day and that there would always be other students who were hold, like on guard outside the door of the, the studio because the police were raiding uh, different parts of the schools that they were printing at. So it's like really rich, kind of juicy, uh, anecdotal stuff about what was going on in Mexico in 1968, which like largely, even though it's so much closer to the US in the sort of political imaginary has been overshadowed by, you know, May 68 in, in France. This is a nice kind of corrective to that. And then, you know, we've got uh, on the, the left uh, is Melanie Cervantes and Jesus Barraza, who were um, at the time part of a, a collective in the Bay Area called Taller Tupac Amaru. Now they're a, a, a duo called, calling themselves Dignidad Rebelde. But um, this was also uh, from the first issue, and it really was about interviewing a, con a contemporary group working collectively about that 
that process and that practice and what it meant. Um, we've always been kind of interested in this way of creating culture, not as individual auteurs, but um, in groups and community um, in context. So the same that uh, it's, it, it looks a little like 60s psychedelic trip out, but in the bottom right is, is a press image from, um, from a group from Germany, uh, Commune 2, uh, that were a political um, squatting project in, in Berlin, uh, West Berlin, that um, was connected to the armed underground um, a number of members sort of ended up going underground, but were known for this sort of like really amazing media stunts that they were doing as well as connected to to political music and um, other aspects of, of of culture in Germany were sort of amazingly kind of influential for being so small and, and marginal in other ways. And then here's the image on the left is from Medu Arts Ensemble, which was a group of South African exiles uh, uh, over the border in Botswana in the late 1970s, who um, in, a way, in a way like the, the Germans um, were connected to the, the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, um, both by creating art in support of it, but also were part of the armed movement part of the mk which was the the underground wing of the african national congress the anc and so um made it was interesting because they weren't just printing posters they also had a music wing and a theater group uh and were doing all forms of all different kinds of cultural uh interventions into um and against apartheid and they were kind of single-handedly introduced and were um key to the distribution of screen print shops um, throughout South, South Africa in the early 1980s, which played one of the most important roles in, in creating agitprop um, towards the end of apartheid. Do you wanna talk about? Sure, and I would just couple that. I think the Medio article, which um, Josh had written, and then one of the former members of Medio has also contributed to signal which is judy seidman um is a really nice piece i think it's in the fourth issue or third issue do you remember i think it's um, in the fourth issue but really kind of goes deep into their some of their uh ideas about cultures uh cultural workers roles in social movements and josh wrote the articles and it's a nice piece of writing but it, it's just kind of uh, i think um very thoughtful and uh had a lot of impact on me, um, you know, some of their uh, words, especially uh, kind of a manifesto on, on, on the, the work of artists and cultural workers. Um, the other two images on this page, one, the middle one is from the Punch Clock Collective in Toronto, which we featured in Signal 3, 4, somewhere in the middle. <laughs> um, and was uh, mostly uh, print and image makers in the 90s and early 2000s and um, pretty like a stylistically diverse group that were um, sharing some studio space and, and um, uh, you know, very political uh, on, a, on a bunch of different fronts, but worked with um, uh, OCAP, right? The Ontario mm -hmm. Against Poverty was kind of a big touch point for them. Um, a lot of work in um, Palestinian solidarity and a lot of anti gentrification work. Um, and then the image on the right is by Rode Moore, which was a favorite, I think, of uh, Josh and mine. It was a Danish um, communist print collective that was part of a larger Danish cultural collective, which include this kind of ridiculous, uh, I don't know, 60s theatrical rock band where the singer wore like a clown nose and like a striped onesie and a wig or something. <laughs> I mean, the, the music to me was always kind of unbearable, but I, you know, totally loved the printmaking wing, which did kind of these word 
uh, like, what is it? Books without words, you know, um, kind of um, political fables of sorts. And then did these collaborative posters. I mean, this to me looks like it was probably all done by one artist, um, but some of them you can really see the different artists were um, doing each image and, um, you know, would try and tell, uh, I think a, a complicated political story outside of just the, 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 the singular image. Um, yeah. Yeah, they constructed these out of, you know, you can you can kind of see it. Uh, this one is is 12 lino blocks that were each individually cut and then printed into a grid. So that facilitated the ability for them to collaborate because they could each take, you know, three or four squares and 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 cut them out. And so you get these nice combinations of styles telling the same story it's like another kind of um way of thinking about how to work collectively and collaboratively uh more collectives here this is from a feature on on three current political collectives uh pangrop sulap which is from uh, malaysia are the bigger picture on the left side of the screen um who are a printmaking collective. They do rad stuff um, and often will do these large scale blocks. And, you know, I think there's a real tradition of like radical printmaking in many countries in Asia where you have these large block printing kind of communal events where they ink stuff out and then there's music and people dance on top of the block. And then that's how they, you know, get the impression. And it's a totally nice uh, kind of uh, alternative to the kind of usual construction of the artist kind of slaving away in a basement or, or whatever after hours. Um, and the lower right is A3BC, which is the anti-nuclear, anti-war, War. anti-capitalist anti -capitalist print collective from Japan, from Tokyo. And also, um, this is another large collective piece. You can, it's kind of it's similar to the Rode Moore piece. Like I think each one of those little squares in there was cut by someone and then it kind of goes into this larger pattern. They're also inking it up and they are also, um, you know, known for these kind of dance party printing extravaganzas. And I always, I don't know what A3BC's current construction is, but they also always used to have pictures of the food they would make as part of these printing parties. So it seemed like a lot more fun type of printing collectivity than uh, I'm used to encountering personally. <laughs> and then on the top right was a group from Baltimore called the uh, Friends of Even Farnes, who I have disbanded, but um, included some incredible artists that are still making stuff. And then Nicole Rodriguez is I think the only one that I at least am familiar with their ongoing work, but um, nice stuff. And then this, these images are, are from a uh, um, group called Jamal Yad uh, from Beirut that did uh, a number of amazing projects um, in, uh, in solidarity with and uh, working with um, people in the Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. Um, number of big collective projects doing these Block prints, uh, block printed graphics um, for uh, annual marches for right of return um, and uh, protests against uh, Israeli bombing um, of Lebanon. And um, they actually walked into uh, newspaper offices and, and asked if they could, um, you know, have these printed at the end of a of a sheet and actually got offered to have them printed as an insert in the paper. And so a lot of their work ended up getting distributed through daily papers um, in Beirut, um, which, you know, is sort of unimaginable uh, in the US. It was another kind of um, nice example of the more researching these things, the more it opens up thinking about different possibilities that you've sort of blocked off in your mind as being impossible and seeing that in other contexts, that's not necessarily true, which means that potentially in your context, it could change as well. And so to always kind of keep all of these interesting avenues open for future possibility. And then, uh, 
you know, on the, we've also done a lot covering publications, which I think when I put these images together, I was kind of surprised with the amount of things that we've covered that are just strictly publications. So um, on the left was a feature on just on the type design of newspapers from uh, exiled Spanish Republicans. So primarily anarchist exiles in France and their continuing newspapers. Um, to the right of that is Anarchy Magazine. We interviewed um, the graphic designer for the covers there named Rufus Seeger. Um, he was a um, very clever uh, graphic designer, mostly in the 60s and 70s, his work on the magazine. And I think, um, you know, he felt had a kind of a big influence on, uh, I don't know, you know, punk and kind of like the situationisty punk look of, England in the 70s. Um, to the right of that was the Club de Grabado uh, si. de Montevideo. De Montevideo. And it's a Uruguayan print club that I think had started out as kind of like a, like a, you know, like a neighborhood art club kind of thing or city art club where you could pay membership and use the printing presses. But during the um, 70s and right-wing governments um, became increasingly politicized and produced these um, uh, series of what they called almanacs or calendars that were um, had a lot of very political images and, and kind of, I think, skirted the lines of what was acceptable to put out for a while. And then I think at one point things got just very, they went very political. Uh, but included like some fairly well met like uh, Antonio Frasconi, who was a, a Uruguayan printmaker who lived in the US and um, I don't remember who else is involved with this. On the bottom in the middle is Palestinian Affairs Magazine, which um, had a huge print run. I'm, and uh, I don't know, how long do they publish for Josh? 20, 30 years or? Yeah, something like 30 years. I mean, we had an immense amount of covers featured a great article uh, in um, issue three or four of Signal, which would just be my mental dumping ground for remember. <laughs> maybe it's issue five. Um, and uh, the covers did a great job of, of like really celebrating like Palestinian artists and um, Palestinian identity uh, that was at times um, very militant, but also at times just very, I don't know, celebratory of Palestinian life. Um, and then to the left of that is the Appalachian Mountain Press, um, written article written by a friend of ours about uh, 70s era movement press in West Virginia, which had a kind of uh, intense anti-aesthetic. I mean, this is probably their fanciest cover. <laughs> Yeah. And then fonts. to the left of that is a cover from Third World Press, which Josh had interviewed the, the in-house designer for, who um, in the article is a little bit about the press, which was based out of Washington, D.C., but mostly printed African and, and Arabic authors. And um, uh, yeah, do you have anything to say? It was just, it ended up being a really nice interview, and, and it was about sort of trying to what it meant to be kind of imagining um, visually, I mean, the writing spoke for itself, but to, to largely a, a Western audience, the, the sort of visual imaginary of, of Africa and, and uh, North Africa, um, and Southwest Asia, uh, th through the lens of a, sort of an illustrator that just sort of happened on this job. Um, and like, it's kind of interesting, his sort of journey through um, crafting a style that worked for this Three Continents Press, uh, which, which translated and published uh, a number of authors for the first time um, in the US, like some of the, like the first novel ever published in Micronesia and was, was put out by Three Continents. So they're really quite influential um, in terms of expanding uh, English speaking access to novelists and poets from um, this part of the world. And so this whole idea of what does that look like? How do you, how do you sort of promote those ideas visually with book covers? Which of course, you know, I'm particularly interested in because I make part of my living doing book covers. So it was great. 
and we'll just kind of fly through. So we've done collectives, historical groups, or uh, publications, historical movements, um, was a little bit of a kind of a catch all for some of the more broad stuff on the upper left. We have um, protests from Quebec City from 2015? No, 11 and 12. 11 and 12, okay. Uh, below that, uh, we took some photos in an early issue of, of uh, mostly Danish adventure playgrounds, which were, you know, of course, maybe not of course, were um, kind of ideas of trying to create play areas for kids or allow kids to create their own play areas to create free thinkers and, and a, a more liberatory uh, sense of childhood. Um, the Grand March Against Apartheid is actually a poster from uh, New Zealand. And it was from an article about kind of the history of New Zealand graphic leftist design. To the right, on the right side are the uh, kind of mildly famous, at least, I don't know, maybe they are. Maybe if you're into like socialist ruin porn, <laughs> they're famous, but um, partisan memorials from Yugoslavia and uh, quite stunning, odd, alien kind of creation, sometimes of monumental size, often on the sites of um, partisan defeats. And um, the image in the middle on the bottom is from Portugal, from the, a mural from the Carnation Revolution there. And then on the really quick on the left is a poster, one of a, this is actually uh, from an article in number seven that just came out, which is a great piece by, by Jordi Padro that basically traces the history of uh, the graphics of the Catalan independence movement from the 1950s and 60s to the present and the sort of evolution of aesthetics and iconography, which is like sort of a really great overview of um, a graphic tradition in one place. And in a particularly a graphic tradition that's sort of where there's this very clear um, articulation of stakes and goals. And then um, on the on the right here is one of many images from an article that was in um, number five, I believe, that uh, is is about the history of the the image of the capitalist pyramid with the boss on top and all the workers at the bottom. Um, that sort of disassembles uh, what this image means and questions whether it's actually useful for us when thinking about how capitalism works and how to challenge it, um, which is sort of one of the more theoretical pieces that uh, we've published, but I think was well-written and accessible and, and really interesting. And then uh, projects and actions. Um, these are sort of a number of articles we, we have that document um, people in motion. Um, as much or more than specific graphics. And the image in the top uh, left is from the PA in Barcelona, in, um, which is a sort of movement of uh, the mortgaged, which is a sort of tenant and housing organizing initiative. It started in the, in the mid 2000s um, and, and became immensely successful, very broad based. And ultimately um, one of the founders was elected to the mayor of Barcelona, as a mayor of Barcelona. Below that is the Peace Navy, which was a Bay Area group that did um, sort of embodied protests where they would go out in boats to try to stop uh, nuclear testing, military testing, um, and, and to, to protest against air shows. And then the whole right side of the image is a poster that's from Basement Workshop, which was the first Asian American sort of cultural center and print shop in New York City's Chinatown. There's a great article about that uh, in, um, is that an issue five as well, I think? Sure. Um, you know, I think I put these images together and I kind of thought we would fly through them and now we've really slowed down. I'm aware of the time we have and I think- we Yeah, we should just, about. yeah. So let's just go through the rest of these as by title, graffiti. Had a lot of stuff on music and printing, printing as a process itself. I mean, that was a, you know, has been a, a focus whether on um, kind of technologies that aren't used anymore that made cool stuff or just on people doing printing as printing collectives. 
Yeah, and maybe just the, the middle image is a t-shirt that was printed by a group called Philadelphia Printworks. Um, and we did, uh, they are also on the cover of the new issue and there's a great interview with them. So just as a specific shout out. Comics, we've only had two on and I think one of the things with comics, sometimes it'd just be better to print a comic if it was a great comic, but these two both had some historical resonance for us, one from Japan and one from Amsterdam. And we've had, I think when I looked back through, we've probably only had about four pieces on, on artists, but like a capital A. And, uh, individual artists. Individual yeah. artists, so uh, has not been a huge focus, uh, which I'm happy about. I think um, the really looking more at work, collectives, movements, things like that. And then we were each going to talk a little bit about one piece that was that that's been in in Signal and um, but now we're you know I think we're running we're running out of time so I don't know what should we do. Um, what do you think, Icky? I don't know. Go and you know if we get the time, we'll go. We'll, okay. We'll go. Um, this, uh, I'll try to zip through this, but I, I did a, a really kind of long format piece uh, in um, issue five about the sort of music that came out of the ultra left uh, in Italy in the 1960s and 70s. And I sort of stumbled upon um, some of these records and it opened up this entire world for me in which like growing up a punk rock kid, I had always sort of been sort of I don't know if I was ever actually taught but it sort of absorbed the idea that like folk music was terrible and it was the music of the enemy and then it sort of dawned on me and you know four or five years ago that wait a second folk means people and that like folk music is literally people's music and that it doesn't all have to sound like the folk music that kind of I knew um, from the U.S. in the 1960s and so I stumbled on these records and um, the sort of amazing collection of material that was being produced in Italy in the 1960s and 70s. Um, you know, Italy had a, had a very strong and militant left, um, something that's sort of, the, the scale of which is sort of unimaginable in the United States, but, um, and, and a communist party that, you know, was regularly elected to different aspects of government um, in different parts of Italy. And so there were all of these, um, People that in the 1950s, uh, ethnomusicologists, authors, and writers and musicians who were really interested in looking deeper at the history of folk music in Italy and figuring out how to sort of bring it back to life and make it relevant to the emerging sort of militancy that was starting in the 1960s amongst the working class. Uh, there's a man named Roberto Ledai who actually in the 50s, he is the one who toured Alan Lomax around Italy to do field recordings which would end up eventually on, on the Folkways label here in the United States. And he started a record label called Disha del Sol in 1962. And that's what all of these images are from. Um, and then there was a, a group called the Canta Cronach, uh, which is sort of song chronicles in which there were what are now very well-known authors like Umberto Eco and uh, um, Italo Calvino were changing the lyrics uh, to historical Italian folk songs to be relevant for the times in the 1960s. Um, one of the most interesting um, and exciting of these music projects and like these, all this music was put out on vinyl record. So this is sort of really before the cassette and absolutely before uh, the CD and streaming. Um, so they were putting out these vinyl records and these are all records that were put out by a group called Lata Continua, which was part of the extra parliamentary and left. So, was both a, a militant organization that were autonomous Marxists, kind of split with the doctrinaire communist party, um, and then also a newspaper. And it was a, it, at, at certain points, it was actually a daily um, far left newspaper that was sold on newsstands across Italy. And then there were a number of these records that were made that actually came in the newspaper. So you would go to the newsstand, buy a coffee and a newspaper and you'd get a vinyl record. Um, and the, the, the record on the top left here is, um, was actually the theme song to one of their political campaigns, Prendi a Mochi la, la Cita, which is Take Over the City. And it was a big campaign in the early 1970s, um, in part organizing um, women housewives to refuse to pay the bills 
utility bills and rent um, as part of a way to kind of cripple the the ability for um, capitalism and, and and governance to to run the city. And this record is by a man named Pito Masi, and it's actually um, all these lyrics that are about how we're going to take over the city. But the music is a Buffy St. Marie song. Um, and I think this is an amazing illustration of how we tend to think about, um, sometimes think about like music uh, and politics and, and, and art and politics uh, as this way in which to, to experiment and to do things that are new and to sort of um, explode convention. And then in this context, it made so much more sense to actually use a tune that everyone already knew. So, you know, folk music, um, was popular in Italy, um, both Italian and other forms of folk music. And so why not use a tune that everyone could already sing along to? Because the goal was to actually get people to embody these songs, to sing them on marches and demonstrations. They would get sung at meetings. So um, it wasn't about innovation. It was about actually sort of conveying the ideas and that this was a vehicle to do that. Um, the, the feminist movement in Italy were you know, amazingly effective at taking advantage of the sort of music subculture and put out a huge number of records. Uh, I mean, it's actually sort of to the point where different factions of different organizations put out their own records. So, you know, there are a number of records that were put out by Wages for Housework, um, but the records from Wages for Housework uh, groups in different parts of Italy had different songs on them and had different politics. And then, um, you know, there's not enough time to get into it, but Italy uh, is really interesting because um, through a, a confluence of different things, the strength of the Communist Party, who thought that rock music was a imperialist uh, um, kind of intervention um, and the way that record labels were run in Italy, there really wasn't access to popular rock music for the most part. It was very marginal in Italy in, until really the 1980s. And so um, although young people could, could listen to it, there wasn't, you know, bands weren't touring in Italy as much. Um, the sort of Beatlemania that existed in the rest of the world didn't strike Italy in the same way. Um, so all these bands really start, needed to, to figure out how to make their own rock music and, and start their own record labels to do that. And so one of these big bands was a group called Area, huge, ultimately like a really big prog rock band um, that started out extremely political. Uh, and this is uh, their rendition of the Internationale, which is, you know, outside of the US is probably the most well-known song in the world. Um, it certainly was in the 1970s, 1960s and 70s. Um, and their version of the Internationale is, is basically like Jimi Hendrix playing the Star Spangled Banner. They completely disassemble the song and then put it all back together in this sort of jazz fusion prog kind of shambling mess this is kind of amazing to listen to and then the backside is a song about george jackson who was a black panther uh, who was killed in prison in the united states so sort of this record is this amazing uh illustration of them trying to represent or re show within the context of italy of what internationalism looks like um, and there's sort of these immensely powerful levels of politics embedded in this music and in the uh, material culture that this music produced. Um, and then this is just an image of, of uh, that music in action. And that like in Italy, at every single demonstration, every single occupied factory, they were filled with song, that there were these, the equivalent of kind of griots um, who would travel through it across Italy and go visit uh, occupied factory after occupied factory and assemble and write songs about the occupations and then move on to the next worker occupation and sing the song from the previous one as a way, a way to sort of create narratives and tell stories about the struggle that was going on on the ground. Um, and so this was just a, a, a long, relatively long article that sort of talks about and engages in that history, which there's very little about, unfortunately, in English. Um, and then this was stuff about the paw that we're going to skip. And then we'll go to Argentina. Okay, and this will be probably fairly quick. There's a lot of images from here. This is an article from the um, latest issue of Signal, and it's I think definitely one of my favorite articles. I think you know we had to work on it a lot. The author uh, Natalia Ravale um, is from Argentina, and her um, 
English is, you know, marginal and our Spanish is extremely marginal. So there was a lot of back and forth with translation and trying to kind of tease out um, meaning. I just, I think required a lot more engagement as editors and that was a fun process. I hope for all of us. <laughs> um, the article concerns uh, these two young men uh, on the left is Dario Santillan and on the right is Maxi Kostecki and they're both um, young, like early twenties activists in the early 2000s, part of the unemployed movement. Um, go back one, let's just hold on that mm. for a second. I'll do it. And um, Dario on the left was much more of a kind of capital A activist had been kind of come out of like youth communist organizing and had kept working in uh, unemployed movements and you know, building, I don't know, kind of homestead squatted homes and was helping set up libraries, things like that. And then Maxi Kostecki on the right had become more involved. I think always been political, but more involved over the summer of 2002 when there was tons and tons of protests um, building up. And he was a uh, art student, also working class kid from south of Buenos Aires. And there was a huge demonstration all around Argentina one day where the attempt was to blockade all the major roads of commerce into the city. And the president of Argentina called out the national police and the military police and all the um, various districts also had their own. It's just a, it sounds like there's a lot of police of various types. A lot of chaos, um, huge demonstrations and the police opened up with live ammunition. Um, so really the story starts with those two young men who were killed um, by the police that day during this demonstration. And Dario was shot and took shelter in a train station and, um, uh, sorry, Maxi was shot and Dario uh, went in to try and help him and, and, and get him to aid and was there both killed by the police in the train station. Um, I think Dario, especially the one who'd been the kind of organizer for longer was really popular in that neighborhood and really right around that train station was where they were based. So within two weeks, they um, they made, people made this mural under an overpass about a block away from the train station. And there were just protests daily about these two. And I think the thing that I will just kind of give a brief summary of the, of the article itself is that the article is interesting. It shows a, a couple decade long um, fight really around this train station, around memory around police impunity and state violence. And it just shows, I think also the way that art was used as both a kind of a organizing tool um, within the entire movement there. And also as a just a very well incorporated into the movement itself. So say that one, the level of commitment organization was really impressive. They would have, I think he was killed on like June 16th, 2002, they both were. And they would have demonstrations the 16th of every month for I don't know, like 15 years in front of the train station. Those would be often would be small demonstrations, something maybe like this. Uh, the next slide. Uh, let's see. I don't think I moved stuff around, but um, we'll keep going. There was takeovers of the station with graffiti, um, some installations with pictures of the of the young men. Keep going. Um, this is an early shot of the station with some graffiti you can see on the roof where the people had started renaming the station, Estacion, Dario, Maxi, Maxi, and Dario station, rail station. Um, so I said there was the monthly protests and then there are also these enormous yearly protests. Um, and this was a large one, I think in 2008 called like the flag of flags march where they made, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of these giant banners. Um, and you can just see the people there stretching out on that overpass all the way across the other side of the rail line there. And the action that I thought was kind of the best was that they just kept changing the name of the station. So it was called the Avenida, Estacion, Estacion Avenida. And they just, people kept going back over these signs uh, painting Dario and Maxi. And sometimes like kind of tight with nice stencils and other times just super scrappy but they kept changing the name of the station for years and years. And there was a, uh, I don't know, we have probably 30 pictures, but I bet there's tons more of the, um, all the times they did it. So there's some kids up there with a stencil and people tagging the trains as they came through. And then, you know, different people doing different work. So uh, Dario was 
either a metal worker himself or was friends with the guys who worked at a metal uh, facility nearby. So you can see the Daria Maxi was welded onto the train rail tracks there onto the uh, station platform railing. Uh, they started thinking about different ways that things could last longer. You know, even if paint isn't covered, it tends to fade. So there was a, a lot of people there working in ceramics and they were making these ceramic murals also and they felt would last longer. And on the right, you know, was a specific action, which I thought was great, where they just printed fake tickets for the train. And so it says, you know, free ride today, don't pay. Yeah. Dario Maxi. And then yearly, they would have these 24 hour, like enormous festivals, as well as like the big march, and they would have an all night festival with culture and music. And um... so eventually, they there was a vacant lot next to the station. Um, they started building on the vacant lot, they made an amphitheater. Um, and eventually got the city to give them the lot. And this is after they kind of started occupying it fairly permanently. Uh, after they were officially given a lot, they built a building there, and the building contained workshop space for um, collective um, sewing and textile work and ceramic work. And then these were former friends of Dario's, who were the metal workers who made this giant silhouette of them on the side of the building. It's a picture of inside the textile workshop. And this is a more recent picture. So in 2013, the station, you know, after 11 year of weekly, monthly, yearly protests and all this art and activism, uh, the city changed the name officially to the names of the, of the two young men who were killed, which I, the author was, a, you know, uh, pointed out repeatedly was not the end of the struggle there. And to them, didn't really symbolize a victory necessarily, but just a, a step forward. Uh, this is a, one of the monthly uh, protests. This was a feminist protest at the time. And I think if you can remember, it just shows a little bit of the evolution of the station as it became more and more covered with murals. And then you can see in the background there, uh, this is like a more modern Google Street View, which I just pulled off of Google. But you can see the building in the back on the right with the giant silhouettes, as well as the kind of, um, covering of the station. Uh, it's a great article. And, you know, Sid, once again, it's a, a nice way to think about how art is incorporated, cultural work is incorporated into social movements. I think, especially with the um, mass amounts of people who have been killed by police here, it's a really interesting um, kind of has some similar parallels, I guess I would say, and, and shows how people there really fought one for one space there to kind of memorialize uh, these two young men um, and did it successfully. It's pretty inspirational. And um, yeah, Josh, you have anything? No, yeah, I mean, I think it's, a, it's, it's some of, in hindsight, I think a lot of the best articles that we were able to to sort of find and, and, and edit and pull together are ones that um, end up really talking about and, and getting into the nitty gritty of the kind of tactics and strategy for using culture as a, a mechanism for, for social transformation. And so this is definitely like one of the ones that, um, I mean, it is also sort of un unfortunately one of the ones that, that illustrates some of the difficulties of having something so small because we've there's probably like 75 uh, images from this struggle that are, are jammed into the these little pages um but but it's all there and and um it's it's a really yeah it's really great um in relation to thinking about what we can do here and, and what else what can happen moving forward um, I don't know why the, the left here got weird, but um, we were we were thinking about doing a box set to put them all together. And so I just threw these in for fun. And then just, uh, this is that image from uh, the wall of Portugal, um, in Portugal in 1975 again, just because sort of love this, this mural that 
is like these people that are in the middle of a revolution and simultaneously look sort of like exhausted and pissed. Um, and it, you know, it's not, it's not your, your, um, it's not your shiny, happy kids on the wall. It's, it's a, it's a very different, um, affect. I think that's it from us. Ash, and thank you um, for wrangling us into this. And we're both, I think, highly organized and highly disorganized people. So appreciate uh, all the check-ins. Thank you everyone for bearing with us. Uh, Josh and I were talking, we probably haven't done one of these together in about five years and I've never done one online together. So um, thank you all. Yeah, well, thank you both so much for, for being here and taking the time to both share the images and just cover a, a lot of ground all over the world. It's a pretty expansive project. Um, I don't know if anyone in the audience has any questions they want to submit, but if they do, now would be the time to do it. Um, I guess I was curious to ask, I, is, is Signal an ongoing project? Is this the last we've seen of Signal or is it possible that we could see more in the future? It's yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's ongoing uh, where we got, we got all the content for number eight um, is, is set up and we're, we're collect, like, we, we know what it's going to be. We're just going to collecting final, um, versions. Um, and that hopefully will be out around, uh, you know, sometime in, in mid 2023, um, maybe in the spring if we're lucky. Uh, and then, um, and then we're, we're sort of at work building a table of contents for issue nine. I mean, one of the things is, you know, we both have, um, this is a labor of love. And so it's always been hard to keep a steady schedule. Um, cause I think probably in some ways, I don't know, I don't know if it's fair to say we've lost, you know, we probably lost money on this. Um, when you add it all up, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter, but it makes it so it's just hard to carve out the time, mm -hmm. but it's been really great. And it's been great to build relationships with all these people all over the world that are doing sort of parallel work. Mm -hmm. I think there's like yeah. a part of our like lizard brains that are want to just get to like at least issue 10. And I think <laughs> we'll get to issue 10 and then we'll say, okay, what, what are we doing? I mean, we've kind of constantly said, what are we doing? But um, I think we're both committed to at least get to a nice round number before we go further. Well, just the small, the small glimpse we got to see tonight, you know, uh, had some really fascinating and worthwhile stories engaging with. I mean, like you were saying, lots of parallels uh, for what's happening here with the stories that you shared. Um, so we'll definitely keep an eye out for, for that issue number eight in 2023. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we struggle, we both individually and as a project, I think struggle with like the, there was no Instagram when we started this. Mm. Like there was no easy way to find or see any of this stuff. And so we're still committed and we think that the project is still has a lot of value, but we're trying to sort of think more critically about what it, what that value is now that, you know, it, it's much more accessible. I mean, and then, you know, a number of the, this stuff was all super marginal when we started and now, um, not only is it more accessible, but some of it's a lot more popular. I mean, a number of the articles um, that have been in single signal have, have the authors have evolved them into whole book projects, um, like the Medu Art Ensemble that I, I wrote that piece about, you know, going on a decade ago. Um, at this point, now is, you know, it's not it's not marginal, but there was a major exhibition of their work at the Art Institute of Chicago. There's multiple books that have come out about them. And so um, I think that now we're thinking more about how do we go further in depth um, with some of these things? Because that's what we miss from social media and the internet. It's really easy to see things, but it's a lot harder to sort of know them on, some, on a deeper level. And so to sort of take advantage of this sort of more permanence in the longer, um, evolution and prep time of a published project to sort of try to to really focus on context and history and 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 the the framing around images rather than just the sharing of images yeah 
Yeah, and uh, someone did just submit a question and when talking about the framing around images and issues, <laughs> uh, their question pertain pertains to our current moment and they ask if there's any examples to provide of how visuals have been used to talk about struggles in a new way during COVID. interesting question i i'm drawing a blank off the top of my head um i don't know i mean i think that COVID covid sped up things that were already in process like um you know 15 years ago there was you know probably dozens of websites that had posters that you could download and use on them but the reality was is that almost no one did that and then I think that for whatever reason in 2016, whether it was the sort of looming possibility of a Trump presidency or just the vibrancy of the struggle uh, around the Dakota Access Pipeline, that we saw the, the sort of idea or the promise of the, the downloadable graphic um, become a, a very profound reality in which there were graphics that were made um, all over the world, but particularly like sort of focused in and around um, the, the camps in North Dakota and artists that were sort of directly connected to that struggle that just like very quickly spread around the world and showed up on t-shirts and banners and people were printing them out and in, in, in using them in local demonstrations. They were using them to raise funds. And it was a sort of moment in which the the promise of the distributed sort of decentralized distribution of imagery kind of became real not just circulating online but people literally printing out their own versions and, and sort of taking these these graphics and repurposing and reusing them and i think that um the kind of isolation of covid just popped that further um where you know there's there's just been um a real explosion of the sharing of imagery um, across uh, the internet and people downloading and repurposing and reusing and you know posters that were made in halfway around the world showing up in in people's windows uh, across the U.S. and and vice versa and and that um, I don't think COVID caused that but I think that it it definitely like sort of help to further that happening um and and to to sort of start to really get us to think more about um online and offline not being totally discrete spaces mm -hmm. but that they they're always weaving in and out of each other at this point whether you're in school or whether you're working from home or um that you kind of need to know how to to occupy both um but they both have different demands and how to how to use culture across different platforms when and how that's been used i mean i think there's pro probably lots of little examples um i don't know if there's any sort of huge examples in relationship to covid i mean i i i I think things like the the if people can remember back to early like the spring of 2000 with the idea of flattening the curve. Um, and the like hundreds of iterations of kind of like infographics about why we needed to flatten the curve, I mean I think that was an early example of like graphics getting used extremely effectively online. Um, in you know to deal with a, a sort of a social pandemic mm -hmm. i don't know you you work in in the medical field so you maybe you alec you better no but i think you actually hit the nail on the head and i think maybe it hasn't i mean i you know things are in flux or are constantly changing but i do think in whatever it was the spring of 2020 that um Josh had actually put together a few downloadable graphics packets about rent strike, rent eviction, uh, healthcare, COVID. And that's kind of traveled pretty far and wide. I remember making stuff. I mean, I made stuff for it and I've seen that stuff replicated and I've seen other stuff from those packets. I mean, that's just, 
not centering Josh's work or my own work in there. I'm just saying, like, at the time, like, you know, it was like if you were making stuff and you could, you know, were dropping it, people were picking it up and using it. And it was um, fast. It was really fast and it was interesting. So, yeah. Maybe something that gets reflected in an issue down the line, maybe issue <laughs> nine or 10. <laughs> I do. I mean, it's an unresolved. I mean, I mean, I think that with the pandemic, a lot of organizations that are were used to doing things in the street had to sort of reimagine how they were going to put pressure on politicians or make demands. Um, and I think some of that migrated to places like Twitter where you know you would try to trend an issue in order to get uh attention on it um and and i think that becoming very uh, adept at using imagery and the distribution of imagery and like animated gifs and and um stuff like that on twitter became important for organizations i think now we're facing a kind of maybe a new phase which is that um i know at least here in new york i mean we just elected a mayor that is sort of like the flip side of a kind of trump character in which that kind of soft power that sort of influence or of loose social pressure doesn't work on him at all i mean he's a, an authoritarian to the to the bone so um you know, I think some in some ways, maybe we've seen some of the limits and people need to kind of move back into the street again. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't know. That's a sort of like a, all over the place, but hopefully that was there was some clarity in there. <laughs> so it's an expensive question. Yeah, fun. Well, great. I, I think that I haven't seen any other questions come in. So I'll just thank you both again for taking the time to, uh, you know, talk with us tonight and share some of these images. And um, for folks in the audience, uh, thanks for sticking out through the through the discussion and submitting some questions. Um, I did drop links there in the chat. Great way to support this project, Labor of Love, uh, is to pick up copies of uh, the journal. So. Like there's a link there. It links to uh, issue number seven, but if you look to the right side, you can see all the other issues as well. Um, so pick one up if you'd like to support the project. Um, and yeah, thanks so much, y'all. I hope you have a good evening. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for having Absolutely. us. Absolutely, for sure. Goodbye now. Night.